I was 19, broke, unemployed, and sold my girlfriend's canopy for drug money. So, I thought I'd better sew her a new one. What a sentence, and what a story. This describes the humble yet outrageous beginnings of NZ Aerosports, the home of Icarus Canopies, in the words of our founder himself. From getting a paratrooper toy from his mom, watching parachutes at the DZ as a six-year-old, jumping off the wharf with a parachute made from bedsheets, doing his first jump at 16, sewing his first canopy on a borrowed machine at 19, and starting to sell parachutes out of a garage in 1986, Paul Gyro Martin had an undying love for the sky. Our company started with one man with the wildest of spirits in a true blue sky dream, a renegade. In the time that Gyro created and ran the Icarus Canopies brand until he passed away in 2017, he pushed everything he had to its limits. We miss him and we always will. Gyro is the next generation of NZ Aerosports. It honors our founder, of course, because it was the name we all knew him by, but Gyro the rebrand also marks the start of a new chapter, our next jump. Gyro is the space between sound and silence, art and science, chaos and calm. Gyro is a state of epic tranquility that transcends understanding. That moment, in the door, in free fall, mid-swoop, where nothing but the present exists. A perfect balance of euphoria and thrill. Gyro captures our passion for flying and our commitment to designing break-the-fucking-rules canopies that deliver pilots pure, wild flight. Coming straight from the cockpit, it's another episode of Lunatic Fringe with the fucking pilot. Ready, set, go! Back in the can with another edition of Lunatic Fringe and a smiling face with a whole bunch of shit going on that I want to hear about right now. So tell me, who the fuck are you and what do you do? Uh, I am Shauna Finley and I am the new DZO for Scott of Shenandoah in Newmarket, Virginia. My lord, I don't know if I see uh, if that's a happy glow on your face or if it's a sweat you're breaking out in. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a little bit of both. <laughs> this is brand new, right? Brandy, brandy new. Yeah, I don't even think that the ink is dry on the uh, on the purchase order yet. <laughs> Holy shit, that's super yeah. exciting. I know we were talking pre-podcast, you're super stoked and it's a happy freak out, but I mean, what a decision. Yeah, dude, I mean, I'm technically an adult now. Like I'm an adult in charge of something and it's, yeah. <laughs> Can you call a drop zone owner an adult or someone just doing a really good job of faking it? Oh, yeah. Let's let's go with the ladder on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll just assume yeah. you're faking it and doing a good job. Well, that works. <laughs> we're definitely going to get into the DZO stuff. I want to hear all about it. And of course, the decisions that went into it and what your future holds. But uh, as always, I want to know how you got started. Again, not just in anything skydiving related, but uh, in anything that the general public would consider extreme. Uh, let's I look. I don't know. I mean, I come from a... Uh, kind of like a really quiet background. I grew up in a log cabin in the woods in <laughs> in the country in Connecticut, you know, and um, was never really, uh, I was a high school track runner and cross country. And I'm a, I'm a, the, the better half of a set of twins. <laughs> My sister is, uh, she's the cool crowd. She was the cool crowd twin. And um, man, it was like me living in her shadow, which now was awesome. She made me who I am today. And uh she told me that I couldn't do something one day. And next thing you know, I'm enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and for the next 11 years. <laughs> so that was, I think, the first extreme decision that I ever made. Um, I would say yeah. joining the Marines was pretty extreme. Now, what year did you enlist? Uh, nine, <laughs> 97. 97. Okay, so and then I went to boot camp the year after. I mean, that's yeah. I, I, it's it's even a touch more extreme because you're talking about a time when um, women in the military was not as prevalent as it is now, especially not in, in a branch like the Marines. Yeah, that's, yeah, we were a very small, very small portion of us. I mean, this was what the the GI Jane kind of generation, <laughs> where it was a Hollywood movie that a woman would want to be in the Marines. I mean, yeah. that must kind of piss you off a little bit. Um, you know what? I ha I knew a couple of female Marines uh, before I enlisted, and it made my decision a little bit easier. But um, like I had the the men in my family were in the military, not in the Marines and everything. And uh, but yeah, I guess I think that's where I got the original chip on my shoulder. What like, was what I, what what aimed you towards the Marines specifically? 
<laughs> uh, they came to my high school and they were doing their their uh, recruiting campaign in the lunchroom. And I just happened to walk by. I had zero interest in doing any military. I was going to go to college. I was going to go to medical school. And and I was looking at a pamphlet and my twin grabbed it out of my hand, kind of threw it on the desk. and was like, you can't do that. She walked away and the guy's like, who the hell was that? I go, oh, that was my twin sister. He goes, so what are you going to do? I go, I mean, do you have an appointment later today? And I marched myself right down to the recruiting office and <laughs> signed on the dotted line. And <laughs> Sounds to me like they paid your sister to play the recruiter. Holy shit. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, here we are all these years later. Like, that could possibly have been it. But man, best decision I ever made. Best decision in my life. What uh, uh, what did the family think when you uh, you decided you were going into the Marines? They must have been. I mean, that's an odd thing, right? Oh, for me, it was. Yeah, I was a big wallflower when I was a kid. Super geek. I mean, I asked people who know me now, and I still am, but I was very, very quiet, not outspoken. So when I came home and sat down for dinner and was like, hey, guess what I did this afternoon? Um, my dad was, he was proud. He's like, I can see that. My mother was like, are you sure? But super supportive, you know, nice. and then they saw me graduate and everything. They're like, wow, look at you. you did know? you did so, you give the twin sister a big... <laughs> It was, you know, it's funny because she was always the dominant twin. And I remember when I came home, uh, we ended up having Thanksgiving dinner together. And I reached under the table to grab like a bottle of soda or whatever. And she kicked it thinking I was grabbing her. And she it hit me in the forehead and like split my eye open. And I come out and she's like, don't hit me. And I go, why would I do that? And she's like, well, I mean, you're a Marine now. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not how it works. So they, they all saw a complete change in me. And it was it was for the good. It was like the old Shauna was back left in high school and whatnot. And sure. Well, yeah, and yeah. I mean, Marine boot camp is no fucking joke. I went through Navy boot camp, which was kind of not a joke, but it was <laughs> kind of a little bit. You know, uh, it was it, no joke. Yeah. I mean, how how many how many weeks is Marine boot? Thirteen weeks. Fucking 13 hell. Weeks. Yep, thirteen weeks. I went through yeah. eight weeks. All I had to do was just march and not piss anybody off. Ooh, I mean, there was some of that in our boot camp, but it was more of like, don't look at people. We learned the knife hand, and you know, it was a uh, man. I loved every minute of it. As as ridiculous and crazy as that sounds, I loved every minute of it. Well, you know, there's part of me though that looks back on on boot camp and thinks that that was probably my favorite time in the military because yeah. I got to shut my brain off, and as long yep. as I just did what the fuck I was told. It was right? smooth as shit. I didn't have to yeah. think about anything, and that that was uh, um, that was a, a very liberating sensation. Didn't last that long for me, but <laughs> it was a uh, it was. I, I found my voice. Like I find, I found. Granted, it was like a whole bunch of yes, ma'am, no sirs, that sort of voice. But man, I found my voice, and when I came home, it was get out of my way, um, or I'm gonna like walk right over you and stuff. And it was it was a it was a big turning point in my young adult. Life. Sure. Now, what was it your was, specialty? Uh, I was an admin. I was a one, but I was really very fortunate because the units I was with didn't do any type of admin at the company level. So I would be maybe one of two women in our entire company or battalion or sometimes a regiment. And it was just awesome because I had a million brothers. Like I had a company full of brothers and they never, at least they didn't show it to me. I, they never once looked at me like I was some chick in a, in a uniform. Sure. You know, well, was, I awesome. I, th I think now, especially that that kind of old antiquated view of women in the military is gone. I think so, too. I, yeah, I, I think they. Yeah, I don't think that's I mean, my generation still very much remembers when it was and, and everything was very separate. And, you know, I was in the Navy and served in, a, in an F-14 squadron where women weren't allowed to serve in an aircraft carrier. You know, yeah. so, and, but that's completely changed. I mean, it, that view is, yeah. is nice and gone, which is a good thing. It is a good thing. You know, and I think that we can be our own worst enemies sometimes. Like I, I was glad in boot camp that the only time we ever saw the guys were on Sundays in church and they were across the, the chapel or on mess week when they were serving our food and it was so fleeting. I wanted nothing to do with them. Guys in boot camp are stinky. I think worse than the women are. Maybe I don't know, but it was it was good to not have the distraction. Sure, you know, and um, yeah, it was it was good. So. Now, so you you were in for eleven years. The majority. So the the last four years were on active duty, um, and then uh, not no. I'm sorry, the time in between, like at nine uh, eleven. So we went on active duty. Our unit got recalled. I was in the reserves for the majority of the time. Um, 
but during 9-11, we were on active duty and then I extended because it just, it was tough to find a civilian job afterwards. I was sure. displaced to a different, a different, um, state. I didn't really have my feet under me in New Jersey. And, uh, then yeah, I got a job with the, with the state police there. And wow. I was doing a, yeah, yeah. I was a trooper for, um, 18 years, 18 years as a trooper. Jesus Christ. That's a, <laughs> that's a, and, and, and now look at how far you've come. You're sitting in a trailer <laughs> talking to some fucking random guy about skydiving. <laughs> fucking a right crazy crazy well so where did where did skydiving come into your life the uh the drop zone in new jersey was in my patrol area now i went yeah are, are we talking patrol. cross keys no that was so that's that's we call that deep south jersey that's a troop <laughs> i was that's uh that's a troop for us no no no. i was in b troop way up north so skydive sussex all right i know sussex yep. quite well yeah i know you do yeah so it was right after the owners had bought it and uh i had just got assigned to this very rural patrol area and my sergeant said hey a new business opened up up in your zone today why don't you go say hi i'm like all right i'll make i'll make an appearance with the with the owner and here I am with my brand new, you know, patrol car. I mean, I go out to the, uh, the airport. I finally find it and I pull in and they must've just gotten done cleaning the fields up and stuff. And I walk in and there are the owners and my life went from like straight forward and ahead, straight up to the side. <laughs> I'm like, right. there's no looking back. No I mean, looking back. did you just, you took one look at canopies in the air and went, I got to do that. No, no, not, a, no, I don't think there was anything going on that day, but they were just, they were very welcoming. And my zone partner afterwards came over and had said hi and stuff. And that evening at our debriefing, he goes, Hey, guess what we're doing, you know, next Tuesday. And I said, I don't know. And he goes, we're going skydiving. I'm like, the fuck we are. <laughs> and, but we did. So we went skydiving and good Lord, the moment that door opened on that little 182, um, it was done. It was absolutely done. I landed on the ground. I was so motion sick. It was awful, <laughs> but I loved it. Um, it was, I go, this is amazing. Yep. Like, I want to do this again. Yep. Next week I did my second tandem and I had my A license, I think within a month and a half, two months. Isn't that the and strangest was, thing? I had a very similar start in that under canopy, as soon as the parachute opened up, I'm like, oh my God, that was the most amazing thing. And then 30 seconds later, I'm like, I'm going to vomit all right? over this guy. <laughs> It was everything I could do not to vomit, and I land on the yeah. ground, and I must have seemed like the least enthusiastic student ever because I was just trying not to puke. But as yeah. soon as I wasn't uh, um, motion sick anymore, I paid for my next fucking jump. I'm like, I'm going yeah. again. This is it. Yep. I yeah. mean, wow. Yeah, it was, uh, man, it was done. And then I think I had my B license by the end of the summer. And wow. I was just, man, I, I, so I'd work midnights, and I would go straight to the drop zone. At, in the morning when I was done, and I remember messaging the DZM saying, hey, is it cool if I come early and just kind of hang out? And she's like, absolutely no problem. And man, it was like a whole second part of my life just opened. Sure. You know, it was a whole different world that I had never been, um, never been uh, uh, experienced with. Like, I, I didn't know anything about it, you know, and over the winter, we did our first away from home boogie in Puerto Rico. <laughs> and that was just, man, that was that was eye-opening. Loved that. It was beautiful. Sure. But um, yeah, now, everything. W was there ever any uh, a flack from the department for doing something as dangerous as skydiving? Because I know in the military, depending on where and who your command is, you got to like get permission to go out and do shit like that. Was it like that, or it was just go no, have fun? No, they thought it was kind of fun. They're like, that's kind of crazy. And they didn't really, they didn't really give two blanks at it, which was kind of cool. You know, there was a couple, there's been quite a few, uh, quite a few troopers over the years that have come and said, Hey, you still jump. You, can you take us out? And I'm like, yeah, let's do this. So a whole bunch of them have come over. Um, they've had a really good time. None of them are, are licensed or anything like that anymore, but uh, sure. yeah, no, they, they enjoyed it. It was good. So. Now at what point in your skydiving career and your career as a trooper, did you realize that those two worlds have very different views on a few things here and there. I mean, it's got to be weird, right? As a as a serving trooper, working at a drop zone where safety meetings happen on a regular basis. Yeah, um, they were. I tried keeping the world separate. Um, I really did, and they, man, everyone was super respectful. They sure. really were. They wouldn't ask me like cop questions, like, "Hey, I got a ticket. Hey, I got pulled over." They were really, really good about that, and they never really saw the trooper side of me. 
Sure. Um, but we ended up having a, uh, one of our friends went in and I was there when it happened and it was me working it. And they all saw, you know, Trooper Shauna. Yeah. And it was very tough for me to, um, to then kind of keep that part of my life separate. And it was really tough. I took time off from work and everything. It was. I can see that. I could see that. I mean, um, because you go to do something like skydiving as a, an escape, um, or at least a distraction from what we consider the real world, if you're still in the real world. Um, so I can imagine that, especially with something as, as horrific as a fatality on the drop zone, that you've got to be the one now shifting gears, you know, changing hats, so to speak, and, and taking charge of the scene. Man, oh, man. I mean, yeah. I, I, I had a much light, more lighthearted version at uh, uh, my job. My first uh, real full busy drop zone was uh, Skydive Las Vegas. And they had a, a, tan, a part-time tandem instructor uh, that would come out every once in a while that was also a member of Las Vegas's version of SWAT. Um, and there was a guy that would come out and fun jump regularly who was a known pot dealer. <laughs> but it was just this un they never talked about it, but it was this unspoken rule that the shit that goes on at the drop zone, the 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 cop would literally just be like, Don't fucking do anything stupid in front of me, and we're just skydivers. Yep. Which was it's an awesome, amazing right? thing. Yes. It is awesome. It is I've never once had any issue with um with they were man, when I tell you supportive, like so supportive. Um, you know, so it was it was really, really great and they made it a, tr- a great transition for me coming from the police side of the house to full time skydiver, full time, um, you know, running the rigging loft and, and really furthering myself as a sky, like super, super supportive. I leaned on my skydiving community so much in the past few years and, and everything. And now, yeah, all walks of lives. Oh, so, yeah. Which is absolutely, I mean, that's one of the greatest things about crazy. it. I mean, that's the <laughs> overriding theme on almost every episode of the podcast is it's the community. And yeah. How varied, but how cool it is. I mean, from yeah. all walks of life, all races, all genders, it's it's just it's just a bunch of fucking cool people. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Amen to that. <laughs> now, how did the transition come into like, I mean, that's a big decision, right? To to decide I'm a state trooper. This is a this is a job that most people have for fucking life. And now I'm gonna go play with nylon and jump out of airplanes. For <laughs> how did that come you know, about? Um I got my rigor ticket um, pretty early on. I had an amazing mentor um, and she was with me for, I think, two and a half seasons. And I thought I had, maybe I had some trust issues. That's why I wanted to be a rigger and do my own, <laughs> do my own reserve. Um, but a Marine was, trooper had trust issues. Come on. And control issues. Yeah. I mean, who would have guessed? <laughs> and maybe, I, you know, I'm not going to say maybe I still have them, but yeah, I still have them. Yeah. But um, yeah, right. To each his own. Uh, but it just seemed like the next logical thing, like control in case you have an emergency, like I need that type of control and everything. Sure. So I figured, all right, that's a real, that's a high demand in my eyes. It's a high demand, high pressure type of, um, type of niche in the skydiving community. That makes sense for me to kind of go from Marine to trooper to rigger and kind of move straight across the line. Sure. There, sure. You know? Now did, did rigging have any other appeal other than that? I mean, was it something that it attracted you in general or it was just a, I get to pack my own reserve. Um, I think I really liked the, like the sewing aspect of it as geeky as I, I was a closet like quilter. <laughs> so before I became, it's so bad. I learned how to quilt from a local quilt shop and it totally got away from me i had like a quilting <laughs> table and sewing machines i made quilts for my bed it was like here you are a 24 year old girl and you are at home on a friday night quilting um a blanket for your bed so no guess that why i was single you know but whatever <laughs> and so when i learned how to sew a canopy patch i'm like this is just like sewing a quilt sure, sure. why not so that was, and just the fabrication of it too. Like I sure. learned how to, once I became a master rigger, I learned how to do like reharnessing and making different components. And man, that was just fascinating for me. Absolutely well, and fascinating. It, it, uh, it appeals to a lot of people's meticulous nature. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, I, I've always enjoyed packing my own parachute 
for a couple of reasons. One, I have control issues just like you. Um, (laughs) Two, the only really devastating openings I ever had were packed by somebody else. Um, (laughs) Not their fault. I let him pack it, you know, so it's still on me. Um, But uh, it really did. Like, I liked having a pretty pack job and you did it nice and the lines are perfect and all the folds are are all even. Yes. (laughs) It's just something about it is just so appealing as it goes into the bag. And and it's a huge level of uh, peace of mind in the airplane. Right. Yep. I mean, absolutely. Gear fear is fucking no joke. Gear fear is something serious. Like after after my first real injury, I remember it was a second real injury. I had such gear fear that I didn't want to jump. I took time off. Like I'd rather just do stuff on the ground. And it was it was really tough. It was a lot for me to get back in the air. You yep. know. And um, but yeah, gear fear was it was almost like when you pack your own. And I had to, regardless of whether it was the last jump of the day, it was like me closing out that skydive. I had to just, the second I pulled that pull-up cord out and everything was closed, I'm like, all right, let's go. Your yep. light's on. Let's do this. You know, yep. it was closing out my day. So Yeah, for sure. No, I had the same thing. I had a, a couple of, uh, I had a, one really particularly nasty cutaway from a blown up parachute that could have been nothing other than a line dump. It's what it had to be, um, which never would have happened had I not been doing every jump that I was handed. Um, yeah. So I still take responsibility for it, even though somebody else packed it, but getting back on the horse and I was at cross keys at the time in a drop zone where you didn't stand down, you know, or you'd get passed up. Um, So it's a tough thing to try and get past gear fear when you got no fucking choice, but to get on the next load and jump a tandem rig that was packed by God only knows. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I, I can yeah. see definitely the appeal of, of rigging on that. And quite frankly, had I not taken things into flying, I think rigging would have been the choice I would have made. Yeah. And it's, it's fun, fun so, right? It, it, I think it's so fun. I will geek out over sewing machines any day of the week. Um, I probably have an unhealthy amount of sewing machines and I'm learning that I do because now I'm living in an RV <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> There's no room for sewing machines in here. And I probably have about 16 of them, maybe respectfully, but they all have their own job, right? Like it's like other chicks have shoes or handbags. I have rigging bags and sewing machines. Like, yep. Well, the, the, my all time favorite rigger that I talked to on the podcast was Mo Valetto, um, Mm -hmm. who tells the story of, uh, finding an apartment for his sewing machines and sleeping in his car. I love it. I, yeah, I could, (laughs) I could totally, and someone could say the same thing about me. Yeah, absolutely. No, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, well, but it, I mean, it, it's beside the fact that it really does appeal to people's meticulous natures, though, once you get good at it, I'd imagine that there's a, a, a huge amount of pride in someone saying, hey, I need a repack because you just saved my ass on this last one. That's got to yep. be cool. It's very cool. And, you know, it's satisfaction for me that, hey, I did a job well done and, um, you know, I was able to positively impact somebody else, you know, as opposed to them having a really tough day sure you know so um yeah no it 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 definitely does and i it's funny because apparently if you are a parachute rigger then you know how to sew pants and you know how to sew jumpsuits and you know like my home ec teacher would be so proud of me right now i think mrs levine she would be like look at you you went from sewing a crappy pair of boxer shorts in eighth grade to wow now you're repairing parachutes and doing life-saving rigging <laughs> right like, right yeah you know <laughs> do you uh do you remember your first save i do <laughs> tell me about I it i want to hear really good friend of mine so he's jumping he was actually the dzo at sussex jumping a um jumping a set of camera wings i'm sure he's done for 20 years and everything and uh i had to leave to go to work so i was working midnight so i i leave and he's still jumping and i'm sitting at my desk and a 9-1 call comes in hey uh, one of those skydivers went in and I'm like, well, yeah, that's not a thing. So the dispatcher's like, Sarge, no, this is exactly what happened. Like th- 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 we saw the parachute going with no one under it. I'm like, all right, that was a cutaway. So as I'm dealing with the 911 call coming in, like slowing everyone down, cause I was in dispatch at the time, um, I get a call from him on the phone. And I was like, hey, what's going on? He goes, hey, do you have any saves yet? And I go, what? And he goes, <laughs> Yeah, you just, you just saved my fucking life. And I'm like, and 
it was so emotional for me. Like I started crying and I didn't, and I'm sitting there in the office with all my dispatchers around me. And they're like, what happened, Sarge? What's going on? I'm like, nothing. He's good. Slow everyone down. He's totally fine. But it was, it was a weird, um, he jumps a pullout system. And when he pulled it out, went to throw it. And I guess the bridle was a little bit longer wrapped around the pilot shoe. And we have pictures of it yep. and just nothing. And you can hear him on his camera and he looks around, he cuts it away, but you hear him saying like, all right, Shauna. You know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was, and they found it. It was still fully packed in, uh, in the, in the D bag in someone's driveway, right in the center of town. Oh and, uh, man. I mean, there was a whole video on the ground that went along with that. He says that he got left there for like 20 minutes. No one came to find him. <laughs> Not the case. It was like eight minutes later because I have the, the 911 call to prove it. But Well, it was, he, was a, he was a DZO. He's going to blow shit out of proportion. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it, man, it was. But I got a nice bottle of gin from it. It was good. And, um, man, the repack was, it was like one of those meticulous things that you just, you're sweating bullets, making every fold precise. And you do it every one of them, but man, when you know that person, you're, you're invested in that person and you know, the, um, you know, uh, like what's going through their head and stuff and you're not on scene. You can't do anything about it. Sure. That, sure. That always will stick with me. Well, most of the riggers that I know are meticulous to a fault with everyone, but their own gear. It's super funny you say that. Yeah, I checked into a drop zone um, recently, and my reserve was out of date. <laughs> <laughs> my own reserve. My I favorite. Was mortified. <laughs> my favorite story ever on that, and I won't say his name because he's still super busy in the sport, but he's a rigger uh, and was busy in a loft at a time, and and uh, he uh, was. I think he was at a boogie. Uh, but he was away <laughs> getting ready to jump and he hands over his packing data card and manifest is like, your reserve is out of date. And they hand him back his reserve packing data card. He says, you got a pen? He takes a pen from mm -hmm. manifest, signs it, dates it and hands it back to him. And they're like, you can't do that. And he's like, yes, I can. I'm the it's rigor. My pack job. <laughs> and, and which, which is a fucking hilarious story. But I mean, again, most of the riggers that I know are meticulous with everyone else's equipment, but their own. And I think that's because you guys know this will work, but I'm not going to sell this product, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we put everyone else's stuff ahead of our own. Like my sure. rig, if I, if I jump, <laughs> my rig will sit unpacked for like a week on the packing mat here. And it's like you get bullied into packing it. And it's a good thing. Like. You know, my friends are just, they're amazing. They look out for my well-being. They're like, Shawnee, you need to get in the air. Like, your rig is sat there all sad looking, unpacked on the packing mat for a week now. Go pack your shit. Let's do this. Right. You know, so I'll get bullied into it, I'll, whatever. But yeah, I mean, it's our stuff. Our jumpsuits are probably the ones held together with duct tape and, uh, you know. Like Most likely. And Most stuff. likely. And that's, that's, that's a lot of the riggers good. that I know. Now it, it's funny that you got you were getting um, um, talked to from other dispatchers when that save happened, because you know well most skydivers know how fucking ridiculous the general public can be when they see a cutaway. So part of you had to be laughing, but clearly I can I can really understand why you would be emotional because you know how much is really invested in that save and what it really means. So. Yeah. Uh, that had to be a very strange moment for you. Well, and because I was so far away, you know, because I, I was, you know, an hour and a half away at work, confined to work, couldn't do, not that I could do anything on scene anyway, but um, I think they all saw how emotional it made me. And they're like, all right, well, tell us about this. Like, we don't know anything other than what you tell us. And man, I got to tell you, I get give that to the whole, that law enforcement side of my community is that they really took the time to understand what was going on because the drop zone wasn't moving anytime soon so if something happened there anything aviation wise there i would always get a text or a call sure and so they really wanted to learn that whole aspect of it so when something happened they knew how to address it properly and it was awesome you know it really was even now like i'm at a, I'm, I'm not in work any longer now and um something will still happen up there or someone will see something and they'll still give me a call hey sorry what's going on there i'm like i don't know but 
this isn't a thing. This isn't how this works. Right. This is how it works. You know. Right. And yeah, it's been uh, it's been awesome. Well, and it's great to have the the community at large involved to such a degree because it makes such a huge difference. I mean, uh, I'm sure jumping in Sussex, I'm sure you got up to Cross Keys every once in a while, and the community there rallied around that drop zone because it was literally in the middle of the fucking neighborhood. Yes. You know, and yeah. I'll, I'll never forget having gone there and started working, and the first time I watched the fire trucks come out to fill the swoop pond up and you're like <laughs> this is incredible they're like yeah. arcing the water into the pond and people <laughs> are swooping under it and just this amazing That's stuff because awesome. the community loved it you know i mean yeah. cross keys new jersey is not a place anyone would go if they're not gonna go jump out of there's an airplane there. yeah so exactly too. same exact thing there's there's nothing there and um well i yeah. would argue that sussex is at least prettier I'll give you that. The area yeah. around Sussex. The first time I ever flew into Sussex, I was actually running gear back and forth for John Eddowes because I had just yeah. gotten my pilot's license. And he's like, you want some hours? Take all this shit to Sussex. And, <laughs> you know, so I'm flying stuff out to Sussex and all the rolling hills. And it's, it's yeah. very, very pretty. Whereas yeah. back in Cross Keys, one of the most popular shirts that a local jumper was making um, was entitled The Garden State. It was a picture of power lines over trees. <laughs> <laughs> running through jersey so it was yeah. definitely a different kind of place so it was a very pretty place oh i love it's very close to where i grew up it's very rural we have a there right down at the bottom of my street there's actually one of the oldest dairy farms in new jersey that if you don't leave at the right time you get caught behind the dairy cows crossing the road going from <laughs> one building to another to go traffic jam and no one realizes that in new jersey yeah like, it's up north and way down south, which I don't know if I'll go down too far south. I don't think they wear shoes down there, but it's uh, it's very rural. <laughs> yep, you know? it is. So it's, it's well, we would got sent up there. It was me, uh, um, young Mark, the pilot, and a couple of uh, uh, instructors were in uh, Sussex. for. They would send us down on the weekends. And he had a trailer in some trailer park about five miles away from the drop zone <laughs> that he would put us up in. And so next thing you know, you've got five or six skydivers doing Doing, you know all kinds of stupid shit all night long in a trailer and then getting up and jumping all day yep oh, i'm sure i'm sure yeah no it's, it's it's been a crazy ride it really has so now how did the transition come about that you decided you know something i think i want to run one of these asylums you know i love the foundation that i got up in sussex and just uh I said, you know, I, I like my own little slice of, and I, I say heaven, but <laughs> I want my own little slice of running my own business. And I want to incorporate what I want to incorporate and, um, you know, and, and do things how I want to do things. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So when the opportunity came up down here at Skydive Shenandoah, um, it was a weekend only drop zone, you know, same owner as Sussex and stuff. And it finally came to the point where I'm like, Hey, eventually I'd like to buy this drop zone. And it just kind of fell into place late last year saying, all right, next year is your year. Let's do this. And I'm like, oh, we're doing this. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. Was right, there was this. was there a catalyst to the behind that decision? It was just, a, you know, something skydiving is my passion and I and I want to own a business in this. Or was there something specific about that drop zone? It's beautiful down here. My God, if you've never been down at the Blue Ridge Mountains, it's just um, the area is just it's breathtaking. It's like almost distractingly beautiful from the sky. Mm. And I think he owned this place maybe three years before I actually jumped here. And I remember coming in, we brought the caravan down for a, for a weekend. I remember jumping in and doing a high pull and I'm like, Oh my God, this is, this is my quiet place. This is my happy place. Mm. This is where I want to be. So I knew that wanting to own this place or be down here full time when I retired was exactly what I wanted to do. So when it finally came to fruition, it was like a, Hey, should I get off the pot? This is what's going on. Let's, let's move forward with this, with this transfer of the business and everything. I'm like, what better time? Let's do nice. this. Nice. Nice. Now so, yeah, it worked out well. What was, uh, um, what was it like trying to make the decision to retire from patrol? I mean, that's, that's a big decision. It's, I mean, it, I think I'm still dealing with it. I'm still coming to terms that I'm not trooper Sean anymore. I am now Sean a skydiver. Like I don't really, I don't share it with too many people and everything. I kind of just, people who know that I'm a, I'm a former trooper, they know, and they kind of just let it happen and everything. But I own the drop zone now. Like this is my whole life. And a lot of people don't realize that I was a trooper beforehand. And it was, uh, so kind of just close that door, turn that light off and just 
headed in another direction. Well, I mean, if you've been so deeply invested in in the world of skydiving for so long, I think that makes it easier to yeah. hide is the wrong word camouflage your past a bit in that you're like no 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 i'm 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 a skydiver and and it, you don't need to uh um present the trooper side of things as some type of identity yeah yeah Cause... so when i was an active trooper like it was um people were like oh that's shauna she's a trooper i'm like guys stop doing that it's like you're like it's like your ex saying oh that's my ex-wife or that's my ex-husband like it's right. weird it's awkward i'm like guys stop doing that yeah and now it's more of like Oh, Shona, she's she's the pilot. She's the rigger. She's this. And I'm like, oh, thank God we we yep. left that jacket I, hanging up in the hall. And I <laughs> actually know exactly how you feel in a much more warped way in that I always used to have people that I worked with that relished being able to tell people that, oh, that's the stripper. <laughs> yes. Was the same thing. <laughs> I had a damn good buddy that That's loved to right. go out in, in Las Vegas with me and he would tell girls on town, he's a stripper. And I'm like, you're shooting yourself in the foot, dude. This right? is, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? This is stupid. Please. I'd be That's in the cool. plane. Hey, your camera guy's a stripper. Fucking stop it, please. <laughs> That's, I love that. I forgot that about you. Yeah, that's yep. right. Here, that's I'm just a fucking skydiver. That's it. Yep. That's, <laughs> my dad used to do that to me all the time. We'd go out for drinks or we'd go out to have dinner and he'd be like, it's my daughter. She's a state trooper. I'm like, dad, like now I can't have a drink because they're going to be like, oh, you're going to drink and drive? Oh, you're doing this? I'm like, you know, and they do it because they're proud of us or they have like, they want to brag about us or something. Um, yep. So yep. I kind of, I kind of try to leave that down now. Like I have, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I, I always called it, it was trying to have the cool factor by association. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, absolutely. which is good wingman. Fair enough. <laughs> so you mentioned flying. Yeah, I got my, uh, my private pilot's license. Um, I think in the 2016, right after I got my, my, my senior riggers ticket. And, um, I had never flown in a tiny plane before. And I learned in a little one, 152. Um, it's a great plane. Like, Oh my, it is. It was like putting a lawnmower on my, like a Buzz Lightyear set of wings. It was the tiniest little plane, but man, I loved that plane. Um, and then moved up to a 172 and I would come home from work in the morning and just go straight down to the hangar, take the plane out by myself, go tool around for a couple of hours. And then all the old guy pilots would watch me struggle to try to push the plane back in without, you know, being crooked or what. I was like that typical chick driver. I'd put it in sideways and do whatever. And it was just... <laughs> But I loved flying and I kind of took a hiatus from it. Um, I was working on my commercial rating and then the whole full-time DZM thing happened and, you know, it just, it got to be too much on my plate, but I'm back at it now. I'm going to get my 172 down here to Virginia and, and start flying again and, and hopefully get that commercial. Uh, commercial it's rating. a lot of fun. Well, and and it, it's very difficult to describe to people that think, um, you know, a, a regional jet is a small airplane. Uh, how mu <laughs> you know how much fun it is to fly something like a 152 it is i mean yeah I, it's like an extension of you oh yeah you know? i well i yeah. got my license when i was uh, 16 originally and uh, my instructor looked like the the girl from the old tv show mork and mindy <laughs> so yeah. i i had this enormous crush on her i'm 16 years old and i am crammed Aww. shoulder to shoulder in a little 152 <laughs> in fucking heaven i'm, I'm sure. flying a plane i think i'm the coolest kid on the block and there's mork and mindy's mindy's right next to me teaching how to fly a plane. <laughs> that's awesome i mean you got lucky i had um a, a, an older gentleman that was my uh that was my flight instructor and it was uh oh, coming around and uh you know oh, there was no room there's no room. He's like a normal size guy, but there's no room. It's like the size of the screen in the cockpit of that plane. And, um, but man, it was, it was so freeing. The first, the first time I soloed, I remember, um, I'm doing my thing. I'm like, okay, Shawnee, you got this. And I'm, I'm talking my way around the pattern and I'm saying things out loud. I'm doing it. I had an open mic the entire time. <laughs> And uh, I remember getting on the ground and then talking, but not hearing anything. I'm like, what's going on? I click it, click it, click it. And then I hear myself and I'm like, huh. And then I hear on the radio, yep, that was an open mic. Great narration. I'm like, 
<laughs> I was just so embarrassed. I'm, I'm going through my head like, did I say something that was not right? And I just, I total blank. But yeah, total open mic. My very first solo. It was. Oh, <laughs> open mics are the bane of pilots' existences, and <laughs> the best one I ever had actually just happened. I want to say maybe three months after I retired from Skydive Dubai. So. It's got to have Dubai already, so it's already a place where you need to kind of watch your yourself anyway and be a bit more yeah. respectful. And I had an open mic, and I forget what the issue was, but ended up grumbling to myself, goddamn motherfucking son of a bitch, just a, a proper rant, and then realized that while I was <laughs> doing battle with this thing, I was keying up the microphone. And luckily, yeah. we worked so long with the controllers there that they knew who I was and that it was totally an accident. So all I got was laughter back from them. But I can only imagine <laughs> the dozens of Emirates jets and all these guys that are heading off to wherever because we're right? on a proper channel. And I'm I'm screaming motherfucker into a mic. <laughs> in dubai and i've been there and i'm like wow <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. not luckily it happened towards the end of my tenure at dubai so you That's know good. it was good <laughs> That's so awesome you're officially now in the hot seat you're uh you're running the show there um are there big plans is it is it a, a well-established drop zone that you're kind of just uh helping guide it along its way or do you have a new direction for things um, you know, there was a really great foundation for me. Um, the previous uh, managers that were here did just such a phenomenal job setting things up the best that they knew how and got a good foundation going. Um, you know, DZO, very supportive and everything. So I'm, I've kind of slowly assimilated myself into the structure, but I've definitely made a lot of changes over the past uh, year and a half-ish, two years. And I have a, a vision and um, I'm very lucky because a lot of the staff are a lot of prior law enforcement, a lot of military, and I can throw a knife hand out or be like, hey, unfuck yourself or, you know, hey, is this jacked up? And they know what I'm saying. And they talk to me the same way, which is great, sure. you know, and um, we all like, like, <laughs> and, and I'm sure you've seen on Drop Zones, you have homeless looking people coming in, throwing drogues and like mismatched camera guys. And all this, like these guys will come in and girls and they have all their Scott F. Shenandoah jerseys on and their shirts. And I'm like, I can get, I don't have to think about what I have to wear. Yeah. Like I'm wearing my Scott Evans shirts and this is good. And, um, but man, there's so many different walks of life here on my support staff that I don't math. Well, I don't ever try to say that I do. And I have people that can look at a number and just be like, done. Okay. I can get this math done for you. I can do payroll for you. I know how to do this. I know how to do that. And they're all homegrown, which is really great. Like our Packers showed up, four years ago both from the from the military and whatnot knowing not knowing anything and now they're running the packing mat they're built they're making new packers they're you know our manifestors they're just it's awesome you know and i want to be able to support a full-time turbine next year whether it be our own that we purchase our own or that we go into contract with someone on a full-time basis and start running like thursday through tuesday sure you know and do that and right now we're, we got a, we got a little one 206 i bought uh when jen sharp closed got out of kansas i bought her um her shark plane oh nice so it's been here yeah i love that plane and uh that's our primary plane now friday through monday but we're going to be having um uh, a super caravan coming in here at least a weekend a month if not more to really try to build up our i want to be a fun jumper drop zone with a tandem problem that's what i want to do like that's sure. my sure sure well i mean that's the that's the big uh fight in the balance for drop zones right is to figure out because no matter what it tandems are where the money's at, but it there's is. a, there's that fine line between being just another fucking tandem factory and being a place where you get to call it home, which obviously as skydivers, all the best memories we have are from places that embrace the fun jumper community as well as made a shitload of money doing tandems. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, it's funny because a lot of the staff that are here have come from other drop zones that they've been used and abused and just, not like not really they were unsure of what they were going to get here you know and the first time i bumped a tandem to another load to make sure the fun jumpers had their load and they're like wait what what did you just do and i go yeah i mean you had a group of five there was like two tandems i just switched them around it you guys good with that and they're like yeah we're good with that mm. you bumped a tandem from a load to get a fun jump around there Cool beans. Okay, yeah, we can get well, behind that. And I would know. think uh, that a lot of being able to do something like that is communication with the tandems, just letting yeah. them know, guys, 
when you plan on doing this, this is an all day experience. We are going to show you a whole new walk of life. The jump being the cream on top of everything, but enjoy all of it. And as long as you have students that come out knowing that they're having a day of it, bring a picnic, have an experience, yep. then you never oh, yeah. have a problem when you do something like that. And then everybody's fucking happy. Yep. Oh, and you know what? And I'm sure you've experienced this, that you get nervous when you see certain licensed jumpers walking towards the tandems. You're like, Ooh, what are they going to say? Not <laughs> once here. Have I ever had that pucker moment? Like, Oh boy, what fire am I going to have to put out now? It's, yep. They speak to the tent and we've had, we've been sitting around the fire pit at night and I'll be sitting there having a drink or whatever. And I'll look and I'm like, who are you? And it's one of our tandem students that just connected with the, the community here and they want to stay. And they're like, oh, I did a tandem with your guy, whomever on a, you know, earlier today. I go, oh, and you stayed? And he's like, look, yeah, I stayed. Is this okay? I'm like, yeah, it's okay. You're a tandem and you're sitting here with the staff. Yes, it's okay. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. And we have that well, on a regular basis. And that's what you're shooting for, right? I mean, um, I always fall back to cross keys as the most extreme example, but we would have, you know, tandem students that would come and then not leave for a fucking month. Now, right? <laughs> granted, that's because that place was insanely fun at the time and, and jumping was just one of the really cool things that we did, but yep. it's what you wanted. You know, I have so many people, especially from that specific time that came out as just another random tandem student that are now lifers, you know, and that's yeah. kind of at the end of the day, that's what you're looking for is just more people to play with. Yep. We have a couple that comes out here. They came out last year and a uh, tandem couple, they came out and they loved it so much. They're like, we want to buy another one right now. And we have the same weekend special, you know, half off or whatever. They bought like four a piece. <laughs> And they made, they would text me on my phone and be like, Hey, Sean, can we come out? Yep. No problem. Daryl, come on out. And you know, you can bring Wendy out and everything like that. And we'll, we'll do another tandem for you. And these guys have been so amazing that they messaged me at the beginning of the season this year. And they're like, Hey, can we just come to safety day? I'm like, yeah, I don't know if we're jumping. <laughs> and they'd show up and they would bring candy and they had just a great time. And, um, it's just, it was, they've been amazing. And I attribute that to all of our jumpers that have found their way to us here that have just kind of made this place home. And, you know, it's, uh, it, well, it's really awesome. I mean, especially at the smaller drop zones that are not in um, typically high traffic areas, you know, they're not outside of New York or outside of LA or something like that. You're talking about areas where people gravitate towards the cool kids doing the fun stuff. And if there's a drop zone around, what better place is there to be when the sun goes down than sitting around the bonfire, listening to the big fish stories or the real <laughs> no shit there I was stories. You know, I mean, it's yep. just fun. It's infectious. One of yep. the, one of the greatest um, pieces of knowledge I have is that going forward, even if I hang it up and never jump again, I'm a skydiver for life. That's welcome at every bonfire I go to. And I've got something yep. to say and stories to listen to, which yep. just makes it so cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I think it's like, especially our community down here in Virginia, it's such a small, very rural area. And we're northerners. When we came down from New Jersey, we're northerners and these guys are not. And um, <laughs> man, they, they opened their arms to us and just took us in like it was nobody's business. And we have the older pilots coming over now and they're like, you guys jump into those perfectly good airplanes. I'm like, oh, you've never seen our plane, but yeah, yeah, come on over. And they watch us and our friend uh, Jared and his wife, Amanda and, and Brandon, they just come, they, they've taken such good care of us that they'll come over at the fire pit, and just sit and hang out, you know, come by during the week and come into the office and see if we need anything. And, you know, and it's just, we've been here, this is our fifth year anniversary this year. And um, people in the community are just starting to get to know that we're here. Like I was just sure. up at the coffee shop and, you know, my DZM, she has a regular at the coffee shop now and they know us in there. Hey, you guys jumping out any planes today? I'm like, oh, not today maybe tomorrow. And they're like, great. And they'll come over and they'll hang out and they'll watch us, you yep. know, and they'll sit by the, on the picnic tables and just have a good time with their families and everything. And like, that's the community that I want to stick around. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and I've seen smaller drop zones that have done really smart things in regard to, oh, it's okay. Uh, really smart things in regard to. <laughs> Claire. Claire's got something to say. <laughs> Someone just knocked at my door. It's fine. I've, uh, um, I've, Oh, it's my neighbor. All <laughs> good. 
No, I've seen um, smaller drop zones that have gone out of their way to try and include the community at large in events that aren't necessarily skydiving based, but just putting the the property to good use. And and uh, it's an amazing way to have the community embrace a group of people that they might not otherwise embrace because skydivers can be a, a rather, you know, scary looking <laughs> bunch. They absolutely can, you know, and our... Uh... We have a, a farm owner that runs a huge poultry farm right next to ours, like all, this, all these turkeys. And man, he has been phenomenal with us. Absolutely phenomenal. He's like, oh, you guys need anything, let us know. Um, the local businesses, even though technically we're right outside of city limits, they have been whatever you guys need. Hey, you guys need propane for the grills. You need this, you need firewood, you need, I mean, coming out of the woodwork. You know, I went up to one, like a local small business owners meeting last week and um, these people are just, phenomenal amazing they 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 looked at me more of a curiosity than uh than anything else but they had no idea the culture that we have here and everything um it it's been awesome it's been really really nice so, well and and i think skydiving is at a phase now too where it's a multi-generational culture yeah. you know i mean yeah. you're talking about jumpers from you know 18 to 75 so yeah. w there's so many more ways to interact with the community at large because there's going to be somebody that they can um associate with and that's the big thing right is the general public if if they only see the the crazy dirtbag looking uh 22 year old right. skydiver they're going to go, well, that crazy fucker, I want nothing to do with that. Yep. But if they see the businessman that's 55 years old taking off his his suit and tie to put on a jumpsuit and a rig, they're like, well, wait a second. You know, and so yep. it's it's a big thing. Or the farmer that's taking off the hat and putting on the jumpsuit. That's a big fucking deal. Yep, it absolutely is. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad that the locals down here have uh, they started coming around more and understanding what we're doing here. And, you know, we've donated to the area um, schools and stuff and supported the local businesses because there's not a lot of a lot of places like to eat here and stuff. So whenever our tandem students are done, we're like, hey, go see Southern Kitchen or go to Jalisco's and tell them that we sent you. And they do. And then we come in for food afterwards at, at night and stuff. And they're like, hey, you sent some of your skydivers here. Thank you so much for the business referral and everything. So it's really it's a fine web of relationships and everything that we're that we're making with these people down here and it's uh, it makes the transition going from new jersey to virginia a little bit a little bit easier sure now are you guys doing stuff like uh, potentially jumping into community events and stuff like that to up your visibility yep. Yeah, so there's a local uh, baseball team, the Newmarket Rebels, and we <laughs> jumped into the stadium last year. We brought 10 skydivers into this stadium, and it, and, um, it was so awesome. And I got a chance to jump the game ball in, throw the game ball out and stuff like that. And I was at dinner probably about a month after that, and I'm like, hey, you're that skydiver that threw the game ball out. And, man, I didn't even – I had such tunnel vision because I'm like, don't throw like a girl. Don't throw like a girl. I've got to make it to the plate. <laughs> And it was, it was, so we're doing stuff like we're supporting that team. Um, there's a local food truck. Um, there's a local food truck uh, festival that we're going to, and we're getting those guys out here in the drop zone. Um, yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of small little things in the community that we're starting to get our hand in. So. Well, and that's the thing, right? Because then all of a sudden the community is no longer watching you from afar, but they're seeing it up close and personal. And I've discovered over the years that communities like that then take ownership of the drop zone. And hey, we have a drop zone in our town yep. and in our town, they jump parachutes into our game and it yep. becomes a, a source of pride for people that would never jump out of an airplane, Correct. which is a fucking incredible thing. Yeah. Yeah, we've caught a couple of people bragging about us and everything, which is really nice. Even our um, FedEx guy, when he comes here and everything, I'm like, bro, you're going to jump with us anytime soon? He's like, I know, I know. P the other drivers have been asking me, you're going back to the drop zone, get some information for us. And I was like, one of these days, yeah. you better just leave your hat in the truck and come on over and we'll um, we'll throw you out of a plane and everything. And so it's definitely the words, are, the words getting around. And that's it's really kind of cool to see. Oh, yeah. Well, that's one of the things that uh, um, actually when I was at CSC, one of the great things that they did was start inviting the local controllers uh, to come for free ride alongs and discounted yeah, jumps. And then I passed that along when I got to Dubai. I started inviting controllers to come out and, and we gave them discounted jumps. And so it's all about bringing people into the community, showing them how cool it is, giving them a little bit of a discount to grease the wheels. And then it's yeah. just it's just a great relationship. Yep. 
Yeah, Sussex showed me the perfect way to do that too. Like they always had a really good relationship with their FA inspectors, their physio inspectors, everyone. I became really good friends with them. They'd come out and audit the loft every year. And I taught them how to be riggers. So then when they went to rigging school, they kind of had an idea of what they were doing. And it was, it was an awesome relationship. And I'm trying to do the same thing down here in Virginia and it's working well. Awesome. You know, I think if we look at ourselves as a bunch of elitists or extremists and kind of rope ourselves off like that's not going to be successful no. it won't be like it, it takes an entire community to run a drop zone it really does and, absolutely um, i'm a big bit and like that's one of the awesome things i got from sussex was how to make sure that you are a productive member of your drop zone and a productive member of your community absolutely and 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 making sure that uh, a, a positive view is going out into the community and that you're representing it in a good way go out and have fun and do all that stuff but also be a positive um, member of the drop zone for sure yep so um busy lady i'm guessing you're still rigging your ass off uh you got the drop zone going what all is going on for you how do people find out about the services not just to the drop zone but of you uh, and then how do they find you on social media and all that so I do have my own company, uh, Fin16 Skydiving Services. I'm on uh, Instagram as Fin16 Skydiving Services, as well as Facebook. Um, Skydive Shenandoah has their own website, skydiveshenandoah.com. And uh, we also have an Instagram as well as Facebook. So we're, we have a pretty awesome social media manager. And um, we, have, uh, we have some social media events coming up, too. We have a bunch of boogies coming up at the Drop Zone. So we do have a Fun Jumper Facebook page that uh, Shenandoah fun jumpers or Skydive Shenandoah fun jumpers that we post all of our social um, activities calendars there. And um, yeah. And is it full <laughs> I'm, I'm service? Sure I'm missing something. <laughs> it's a, a tandem, obviously. Do you run uh, AFF courses, rigging and all that stuff? So we definitely, we have um, some leftover AFF students from last year that we're getting current, current early this year. We're going to be running hopefully some AFF slash IAD uh, programs coming up at least once a month throughout the summer. Um, We'll do students on, we like to do them on Sundays and Mondays. It's a little bit less busier of a day, but we do offer that. It's on our website as well, um, awesome. along with our phone number there. And we're big text messagers here too. So the phone number on our website gets text messages to a couple of our phones and usually get an answer pretty quick. Um, and we get the emails as well. At, I think our primary one is info at scottfshenandoah.com. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I've had a, a, a nice relationship with a, a Facebook page called the Beginner Skydiving Forum for a while. Yeah. It's an amazing page. It's got a huge following. Uh, so hopefully lots of the people that are uh, either just getting started or thinking about getting started in your area can now aim your direction now that they know it's a full service drop zone. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really awesome. Like we yeah. love seeing new faces here. I love getting text messages from even if it ends up being like after midnight or after hours and whatnot. We get some really good questions and man, we're just, we're getting out there socially. Like people are starting to know our name now, which is just fantastic. I sit back and smile and I'm like, <laughs> who would have thunk it when we got into skydiving, it was a bunch of crazy fucking people doing stupid shit. And now it's like this well-respected community and doing amazing things. <laughs> it really is. I'm so, I'm very lucky to be a part of it. I really am. And I can't see, I can't wait to see where this next season goes. You know, I, I, hopefully it's going to be a really, really good one. And uh, Sean, I'll tell you what, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time. Uh, I know you're, you're locked yourself in your trailer to have a conversation with me this morning. And I'm sure there's more pressing shit for you to be doing than talking to me, but it's been a blast. No, thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity. It's been really fun. And to finally see you, and I know we're, you know, a world away and whatnot, but Hey, I'm always here. If you ever need anything, if you ever want to get in touch again or whatever, you got my number and stuff. And it's the best part. Fun. I can't uh, wait to, uh, Best part about being a skydiver is I know I got couches all over the place, so don't be surprised. Yes. yes. Take, hey, my door's always open. <laughs> take care. Well, there you have it. Another episode of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast brought to you as always by, well, wait, not as always, actually. Brought to you now by Gyro. Formerly known as NZ Aerosports, you'll head to gyro.com for their next level line of canopies. By Pussfoot the Extreme Sports Collective. Head over to Pussfoot.com to check it out. By Summit Parachute Systems. Check out SummitParachuteSystems.com to talk to Jarrett Martin and the gang about kick-ass pilot rigs, rigging courses, and more. By Flyaway Indoor Skydiving. Go to FlyawayTN.com and check out all the cutting-edge stuff to come. 
by Pure Spectrum CBD. Head to PureSpectrumCBD.com to check out their wide range of CBD products. And as for us, head to the LunaticFringePodcast.com to listen to any of the hundreds of episodes currently available. Hit the link for our YouTube channel, pick up your copy of the Lunatic Fringe book or The Accidental Stripper, and get a sneak peek at upcoming guests. Once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.